Well, Father, we just thank you for another Resurrection Sunday, God. We just thank you for uh, just coming and dying and being raised for us. We thank you for all that you've done. And um, help me this morning. Help me to deliver this message the way you would like for it to be delivered, God. And help us understand how the resurrection is the foundation of the gospel. But if there was no resurrection, God, we wouldn't have the justification that we have, the, the righteousness that we have in you. And so, Father, I thank you right now. I just ask that you just, just speak through me and uh, speak to me and speak to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, my message today, uh, the theme is pretty much if Christ wasn't resurrected, you know, Christ being resurrected is the foundation of the gospel. When we come in, we got the week preaching the gospel, preaching the grace of God. But um, I'm going to start off with this scripture here. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to go through this whole chapter. But um, I feel like this is where Paul was pretty much, you know, hammering the nail at about Jesus' resurrection. Okay. He said, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And, but if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Um, there had been some, some rumors going on um, within the church, really some doubts, you know, which is something that, that's common along, uh, amongst uh, Christian people. Not everyone is going to be 100% in their belief, but there was some doubts going on that there was no resurrection. Like, you know, you die and then that's it. And so Paul is, is here. He's coming against that, that, um, that, that falsehood about Jesus not being resurrected or the dead not being resurrected. Okay. So now we're going we're to go back. Same chapter, verse 1. Uh, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. Another translation saying, um, I'm clarifying the gospel that, that which I already preached to you, which you also have received and in which you stand. So notice that um, the, the gospel is not just for the unsaved, it's actually for the believer as well. It's for the believer and the sinner. And so you receive the gospel, and even when you after you receive the gospel, you have to stand in the gospel. And so verse 2, it says, By which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all, which was also which I also received, excuse me, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, notice here too that Paul considers the the the, the, the testimony and the accounts of Jesus Christ um, as scriptures. See, when a lot of the New Testament that was written was written by Paul. So it's not that he doesn't have the Bible the way we have it today. And but the accounts of Jesus Christ, you know, the, the gospels about his life about his life story, how he died for our sins, Paul considers that to be scriptures. He acknowledges that scriptures. Verse four, it said, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas. Cephas is Peter. When you see Cephas, is, is, is talking about Peter. Now, Peter was the guy that when the pressure was on, he was the guy that denied Jesus Christ. When um, they said, no, you, you were with Jesus. No, I wasn't. I wasn't with Jesus. And to the point, they say he even, he even cursed, you know, that he wasn't with Jesus. And, um, but, you know, once God started working, you know, he's able to complete it. Because Peter, Peter denied Jesus, but he's the same one that died for Jesus. And so if you look in the book of Acts, you see Peter was persecuted for Jesus. He went to prison for Jesus, but he had seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He had he's seen him in his resurrected, resurrected state. So it, 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 it kind of sealed his belief to the point that he was willing to die for Jesus. Amen? Mm -hmm. A lot, and, 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 and the disciples, like, they wasn't just running around just going for something that they, they heard. A lot of them had walked with Jesus and actually seen him after he had resurrected him. So these guys were all in and going all out to, for Jesus and willing to die for him. Then by the 12th, he was seen by Cephas, Peter, then by the 12th. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, 
of whom the greater part remained to be present, but some have fallen asleep. So he was also he was seen by small groups and large groups of people. And then Paul is saying he was seen by the, the, you know, the greater part of these people that have seen him, who are pretty much he's saying the majority of them are still alive. But some of them have died, some of them have fallen asleep. But, and the reason why he's using fallen asleep because it goes with the whole theme of what he's talking about, that those who uh, die in Christ, they, they just sleep, they, they'll be resurrected. So um, he's saying the greater part, the majority of them are still here. And what, what I kind of get in it is like, you know, you can ask, you can ask around, you know what I'm saying? Like, you ever, you ever been, like, trying to prove something to someone, you're trying to prove a point, and you're like, you know, well, you know, such and such was there, you know what I'm saying? Sean was there, he, he was there, he saw it, and so, you're like, you know, these people were there, and they saw him. And he's trying to convince them that, you know, Jesus was resurrected. Verse 7, after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. I love Paul's uh, testimony because Paul is like, you know, like we just talked about Peter. Peter was the guy that denied Jesus. You know, he wasn't really all in. He was willing to say, yeah, I'm, I'm walking with you, Jesus, and I'm following you. But when push came to shove, he, he was like, I don't, I don't know him, you know. Paul was someone that was going all out for, he was a religious guy. You know, he wasn't just killing Christians because he's just killing Christians. A lot, of, a lot of times we talk about how Paul was a murderer and this and that, but he was doing it because he was being loyal to Judaism. And so Paul, as one being so religious and so legalistic, you know, you know how many, how many legalistic people you know today that's willing to say, you know, what I was doing is wrong and now I'm coming to the right way, you know what I'm saying? And so the resurrected... Jesus, Jesus being resurrected changed the religious guy to one of the greatest apostles from, from being a religious man, so legalistic in his ways, so dogmatic in his ways, to being the, the, the pioneer of the message about grace, you know, the grace of God. It, it changes religious people. Now I'm gonna scroll on down, what was that other verse? So we're going down to 12. That's pretty much he just talked about his testimony. Um, now verse 12, he said, Now Christ is preached, this is where we was at when we started off at. Now Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? You know? Like, how can you preach about Christ being raised from the dead and then say that we don't, we're not raised from the dead. We just die off. And it's just, that's it. Like, what would be the purpose of Christ being raised if we we're never going to come with him. What would have been the purpose of such a great miracle? He said, but there, if, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If, if we don't, if we're not raised, then there's no point. There was no, it was, there was, Christ was not risen. If we don't resurrect from the dead, then Christ wasn't risen either. And he said, if Christ is not risen, then I'm preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. And um, pretty much what he's saying, if, if the tomb wasn't empty, then our preaching is empty. There, there's no such thing as him still being there, or, um, but you know, but we have faith in Jesus. But he, he's just like the rest of the rest of the prophets or other religious men like Muhammad or Buddha. You know, they were never raised. And so, um, yes, we are found false witnesses of God if Jesus wasn't raised, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise. But the dead do not rise, but Christ, then Christ has not risen himself. Verse 17, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So if Jesus wasn't raised, then there is no remission of sins there. And um, let me look at another scripture to kind of reference that. Um, who, which is Jesus, was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. That's pretty much saying this. He was crucified for our offenses. Our offenses is what put him to the cross. But him being him being raised up is our justification. And it's, it's not really a new concept. It's really something that was even in the Old Testament where um, the prophets represented God to the people. But then the priests, Jesus is our priest. Jesus rep 
represents the people to God. And then even the Old Testament, the priest, the high priest, he represented, they represented the they represented the people to God. So that's why they had to live uh, sanctified lives. You know, they didn't really do a lot of things. They couldn't do what everybody else was doing because they had to live set apart. Because they were representing the people to God. And when they were when they were acting up, then that's when there was a lot of trouble with it amongst the, the tribes. And so Jesus, being our high priest, he sits at the right hand of the Father as a representation of us. And that's why God looks at, he looks at, he doesn't look at us according to us. He looks at us through Jesus Christ. That's why we've become one with Christ. We are the body of Christ. Another, another uh, symbolism, you see, you know, it says that we are one with the body. But it says, like, you know, we're the bride of Christ. And that's just pretty much to say how two become one. And so we're one with our priest. Amen? Mm -hmm. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's the first. But the, he's the first amongst many that will be raised. For since by man came death, but also by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. For each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Right? So Christ being the first root. Another, another uh, a scripture says that uh, Christ is the first root amongst many brethren. Right? And so, just like as in Adam, everyone dies. In Christ, everyone can be made alive in Christ. And, uh, and saying Jesus is the first root among, among those you know, who believe and those who are in Christ. And then it says, afterward, those who are Christ, who are Christ, who belong to Christ, at his coming. Now, this is this is a, this is a whole another message, and I was not going to go into detail about, but notice how it says, Christ the first roots, afterward, those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end. And so there's something to ponder on. At the when Christ comes, then then will be the end. And it says, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Death is, is, is the greatest enemy. I know we look at you know Satan as the, the accuser and how he's such an enemy to us, but the greatest enemy is death because it's one thing, you know, you know, the, the enemy, you can take authority over that, over what he does. But one thing about death is, like, it eliminates everyone. You know? But it's going to come a time when even death is going to be destroyed. Uh, the last enemy of mankind is death. And it will be destroyed as well. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, Jesus, the Father put everything under Jesus. Now, when everything is made subject to Jesus, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour. I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And pretty much what Paul is saying is like, I go through a lot for this gospel. You know, I'm not going through this just or nothing. If this is if this is just some some made up thing, some fairy tale, you know what what am I doing? And so we know Paul's testimony how he was knocked off his high horse, and he, the Lord appeared to him, and uh, it changed his whole life. And he went from being 
uh, such a such a uh, religious guy to a man of grace. And so he's saying, like, you know, what am I doing? If I'm doing, if I'm going through all this. And what is my boasting? What, is, what? Why am I fighting with all these people if if it's if it's nothing? You know, let us eat and drink, and tomorrow we die. Verse thirty three says, "Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits." I had to share this with. Uh, the brother I'm going to go visit this morning, and um, I know this is a little off topic, but you know, right now he's kind of in the situation. He's embracing it because he feels like you know he was slipping when he was out. Now he's in, and he, he, you know, the Lord is working on him and cleaning him up and getting him back and getting him back in order. But I, I reminded him of this, you know, um, when you get back out, you know, watch the company that you keep. You know, evil company will corrupt good habits and good morals. The habits that you're establishing now while you're in, you know, you want to keep these habits when you get out. You don't want to be hanging with the wrong people that's going to corrupt these good habits. But I like to look at the flip side of it. The evil company will corrupt good habits. Then what about good company? Will probably promote good habits. You know what I'm saying? Instead of corrupting, instead of the evil corrupting the good habits, you know, what about having good company and good fellowship? that it might inspire good habits. Amen? Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now one thing about it, if, you, if you're going to ever get free from sin, you're going to have to understand the righteousness that you have in Christ Jesus. Um, it's, you know, to not sin and to live a, to sin less, you know, not saying you'll never sin again. But it's, it's rooted in the fact that you are righteous and you've been made right with God because of Jesus Christ. And until you understand that, you'll never be able to get to a place, um, a more disciplined life. You know, it's not a, not a, you know, just willpower. Willpower is not enough. You have to understand that you have been made right in order to do right. But some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Foolish one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. Um, when you sow a seed into the, in the soil, it's never, it never grows into that same, like one big seed just keeps growing. It changes, it dies, and it becomes something different, something else sprouts. Amen? And so just as when we, when our time comes, or something like it says, not everyone's going to sleep. So to some of you, but we're going to all be changed until our resurrected form. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, and it is raised in incorruption. Um, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Um, it, it was interesting, I, you know, after you know, I'm studying on this, uh, there was a time when Jesus was a, would appear after he had resurrected and they didn't even recognize him. Now people that actually walk with Jesus every day, um, and they were at his, you know, his tomb, or when he appeared to his disciples when they were fishing, and it's like they didn't, they didn't recognize him. When he walked with the disciples on um, the road to Emmaus, uh, it's Josh's favorite road we like to talk about, but um, they didn't recognize Jesus as he was talking with them. It wasn't until it was something he said, and they realized it, and then he was gone, he vanished. Or when he was eating with them. Um, you know, he's breaking bread. And once he broke the bread, it was like something familiar about how he broke it. And he realized it was Jesus. And that there was something interesting about that, that he was, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't his natural self. He was raised different. 
Verse 45, and so it is. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is of is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as he is, we will be, and we are. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Amen? Still with me? Mm -hmm. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. We look forward to, to that glorified body. Uh, it's just amazing how, like, I look at it too. Another point I just want to talk about is uh, that the glorified body was like, all right, one thing I'm going to say is that we all are made up of atoms. All of us. All of us are made up of atoms. Like, even, even, even these chairs are made up of atoms. Um, some atoms are further apart, but there is like a material substance that's in this universe that we live in, right? And it's like the... When Jesus came as a resurrected form, it's like he, he, he was able to be there and then kind of disappear and vanish. He was able to go through the walls, you know. So it was like he was physical enough to eat and to sit there and to be touched. But also the, the body he had was able to, to just to vanish and to go through walls, you know. And the same, like, you know, we will have that same thing as he had. We, we, the same that we picked up from Adam. We're gonna pick up from Jesus, and so I just I just think about sometimes it's mind blowing that what kind of material, you know, you know what kind of what kind of substance is this? His body, you know, I look forward to it. Behold, I tell you a mystery: we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Again, like I pointed out before, at the end. Um, now he's pointing out the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The mortals will be mortals. Okay. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. When we talked about how death is going to be the last enemy that's going to be destroyed. But when we have put on immortality and our body has been chained, we have a resurrected form. Because as Jesus is, so are we. Um, death is going to be swallowed up. There, there wouldn't, there's not going to be death ever again. It will be non-existent, and we'll live on for eternity. We're we'll going to John, chapter 11. Um, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. He, he's talking about Lazarus, right? Jesus came. They actually tried to get Jesus to come earlier than he came, but uh, Jesus kind of tarried a little bit. He didn't come. He didn't come as soon as they wanted him to come, but he still showed up. And so when he came, Lazarus had already been dead four days now. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. So it wasn't that far. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now, him saying that, he didn't really signify that he's about to do a miracle. He just kind of said, your brother will rise again. And, um, and the way she took it, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, she understood the resurrection. And you see, again, you see the last day, the end, the last trumpet. 
Um, and she's saying, yeah, I know he's gonna, I know he's gonna rise again on, on the resurrection when everyone is, you know, risen when you come again, your second coming. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And I love that. Jesus said, I am, I am the resurrection. And it kind of reminds me of uh, when they were trying to question Jesus about the Sabbath. And, uh, you know, he had, um, he did things that they thought wasn't right on the Sabbath. And they tried to question him about it. And he was like, you know, I, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, Jesus pretty much told him, like, you know, this is my, like, this is my show, you know. Um, I'm the author and the finisher. Like, I, this is my book. So if I decide to resurrect him right now, I can do that. If I decide to heal someone on the Sabbath day, I can do this. This is, this is my thing. And so, you know, she's like, you know, I know you'll be resurrected on the last day. He's like, you know, I, I am the resurrection. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? It's going back. First Corinthians, it said, Now the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. That's a very interesting point right there. It said, The strength of sin is the law. A lot of times people think that grace is the strength of sin. They think if you preach grace, it's going to strengthen and encourage people to sin. And that's as God was. The law is the strength of sin. The law is what Paul was talking about when he was saying, you know, that which I try to do, I end up doing. I try to not to do this and that. He's saying, he's, he's talking about a person that's trying to obey the law and seem to can't get it right. You know, they keep falling. And so it's the strength of sin. It says, he said another time, he said, if it, if it wasn't for the law, I would not have even known what sin was. And because of the law, sin was revived, and I died. But, um, yeah, you understand that you get that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So grace is what empowers you to not fall. Uh, it was something that Josh said recently. We was at a Bible study, and uh, he said, um, you know, you can't freely, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing it, but he said, you know, you can't freely stand and do right if you don't have the freedom to fall. And your freedom to fall is not because just so you can fall, but it's the freedom to know that if you fall, it's okay, God loves me. So now, with that confidence, you can stand and do right. Um, another illustration he gave is like uh, an acrobatics. Um, the acrobat, he, he, they swing from different um, instruments, you know, they, they swing around and do flips and stuff like that, or they walk on a tightrope, now imagine if there is no safety net. It's a lot more. It's a lot. I think it'll be a lot more nerve-wracking to try to walk on a tightrope or do flips and stuff, knowing that yo, if I fall, it's over. You know, even like playing basketball growing up, like when you're at the foul line and let's say if you're already ahead, where you can, if you miss a shot, it's no big deal. But when you need to make the shot and like if you know it's counting, like your win is counting on you making a shot. It's a lot more intense, you know, and you know, see, you know what I'm saying. So having, so grace is like that safety net that's there. If we fall, we're caught, but it frees us to stand up and do what we need to do and perform, perform in this life and do the right thing. Look back. Okay, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ by the grace of God. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. After he gave them all of this, after he gave them pretty much clarified the gospel, gave them the foundation of the gospel, which is Jesus being resurrected, and now he's, now he's able to say, hey, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Um, Note that I'm going to point out right here about the victory. I love that. He says, the thanks be to God who gives us the victory. This is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. 
And he's pretty much saying the same thing. Go back. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Which is the sharing of the gospel. The knowledge of Jesus Christ. Um, but he's saying thanks be to God who always leads us in victory. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Always gives us the victory. We all have the victory here. And, um, but the reason why is, I'm going to break it down here, why we have the victory. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Um, before I go into verse 11, I'm going to point out something. And this is, this is just for you, you know, you can put this in your pocket. Um, you know, a lot of people, if they want to argue with you about, about the Trinity, and about God being one, um, about how God is one God, but there's three persons. And there's, an, there's, there's, no, there's no difference. But um, just notice what he said. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Right? The Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. It's no distinction. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of, your, because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now he's calling the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now he's saying, if Christ is in you, now, say verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, the Father, the spirit of the Father from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So to Paul, um, there wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, the spirit of God, the spirit of the Father, the spirit of Christ, Holy Spirit, Christ, it's all the same to him. You see that? Now verse 11, he says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, I just want to focus on the first part, right? Because um, it's saying here, like, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead you know, the spirit that, that performed the greatest miracle dwells in each and every one of us. Jesus raising, Jesus being resurrected from the dead is, is the biggest miracle in the history of mankind. And the spirit that performed that miracle dwells in each and every one of us. This is why we can go back. This is why he's saying, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. You know, but thanks be to God who always gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we have the victory. Because the, the greatest thing that was ever done, the greatest miracle that was ever performed in the history of man, the spirit that, that performed that miracle is in, in each and every one of us. So what else, what else can stop, what else is, is out there to stop us? Nothing. And this is why we always have the victory in Christ Jesus. Because we have the, the spirit that has overcome. Jesus says something. He said, in this world you will have tribulation. I'm not saying that we're not going to have trials and tribulations and challenges in this life, but he said, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And so Jesus has overcome the world. He has overcome death. And now Christ is in us. The one who overcame everything resides in us. And so I don't know, you know, whatever anyone is in here, what, what they're facing, whatever you might be facing, whatever challenge, know that you have the victory because the one who is victorious is in you. And he will not be defeated by